So, do drug companies put profits before patients in the U.S.? With me to discuss this is Dr. Sidney Wolf, co-founder and director of the Health Research Group. Next to him, Dean Baker from the Center for Economic and Policy Research here in Washington, D.C. And from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Wendell Potter, an author and corporate health analyst. We also did ask GlaxoSmithKline to take part in this discussion, but the company declined. Dr. Sidney Wolf, then, is this uh, an historic moment or is this simply dismissed by the industry as a cost of doing business? We were always taught when we were growing up that crime does not pay. The weak signal from the government, namely a small fine and no one going to jail, is really a statement that crime does pay because company after company, including Glaxo, repeatedly do these kinds of things. They pay their money and then they go ahead and make more money. We had done a study looking at 20 years worth of criminal and civil penalties by the drug industry and even before this three billion one, Glaxo had already amassed 4.5 billion of others. They were the leading company and they just keep repeating the, the silly statement by Andrew Witte, the Glaxo official, that this is all in the past is just silly. Every time someone does this, they say it's in the past, but it's also but, but in, fact, in the future. GlaxoSmithKline is lauded in the industry as being the leader in transparency now because of the work of Andrew Witte in cleaning house and so forth. Is none of that true as far as you're concerned? Though? Well, one of the interesting things is that Glaxo tried to preempt this announcement of $3 billion last summer by stating we have arranged our books that we're going to have to pay $3.2 billion. There's up the next day. So I think that the, the belief by everyone is that the amount they're paying is so small compared with their earnings that they can just afford to do it over and over again, particularly because no one goes to jail. There are doctors or patients who will spend two years in jail for illegally selling a narcotic or something. But here is a company that has done things resulting in huge numbers of deaths and injuries and they go away without anything other than a trickle of money compared with how much money they've made. Wendell Potter, this is so reminiscent of so much that you've written about in the past about the healthcare, the, the healthcare system as a whole. Um, is this sort of thing simply factored in then? Well, it certainly is. It's, uh, it is a cost of doing business because these companies are under enormous pressure from shareholders and Wall Street analysts to make sure that they're earning a certain amount of money. And Dr. Wolf is exactly right. When the company announced that it was going to be taking a charge against earnings in anticipation of the settlement, shareholders just didn't even blink. The stock price did go up. So it is built into, into their expectations. And uh, they know that these companies will continue to do this because there's so much money at stake. Uh, we have, uh, I mean, uh, several companies have recently been found to be acting uh, illegally. Um, in January 2009, the American pharmaceutical giant Eli Lilly agreed to pay more than $1.4 billion for illegally promoting the drug Zyprexa. Prior to Glaxo, the previous record-setting case involved Pfizer, Inc., which in September 2009 paid $2.3 billion for improperly marketing 13 different drugs, including Viagra. In April of this year, Johnson & Johnson and a subsidiary were ordered to pay more than $1.2 billion for minimizing or concealing dangers associated with the antipsychotic drug, Risperdal. And in May, Abbott Laboratories settled for $1.6 billion in regard to false marketing of the anti-epileptic and mood-stabilizing drug, De Pecote. I'm not sure if I pronounced that particular one correctly. Dean Baker, it's interesting, this also is reminiscent of, of much that you write, the financial industry and, and other industries there. And in this case, as we heard, thousands might have been killed as a result of this sort of action, and yet no one goes to jail. No, it is remarkable. I mean, obviously, they're doing the calculation, and, and uh, as Dr. Wolf was saying, it comes out in their favor that you might as well take the risk here. And you know, the basic economics here are fairly straightforward. We know that these drugs can be produced, with few exceptions, very cheaply. You get generic drugs for five, six, seven dollars a prescription. They're selling them for for a hundred times that, sometimes a thousand times that. Naturally, there's an enormous incentive for them to, to, you know, lie, cheat, steal, whatever, try and push these drugs in contexts where they're inappropriate, where they might not be helpful or even harmful. And these fines really are just piddling by comparison. Uh, we'll, we'll go into, the, the, into the, the systemic problems in a moment. But first, Dr. Wolf, then, perhaps you can help us understand some of the, some of the specifics. Actually, here are some of the specifics of the charges against GlaxoSmithKline. Though the antidepressant Paxil wasn't approved for use by patients under 18, the company illegally marketed the drug for use by children, even when a clinical trial found teenagers who took the drug for depression were more likely to commit suicide than those taking a placebo. Glaxo also hired a company to write a medical journal article downplaying the risks. The company claimed another antidepressant drug, well, uh, Brutrin, Brutrin rather, was beneficial for weight loss and treating sexual dysfunction. 
The firm used PR firms and paid several doctors, including the U.S. celebrity doctor, Drew Pinsky, to promote the drug. Um, for seven years, Glaxo failed to report data showing its best-selling diabetes drug. Avandia increased the risk of heart attack by as much as 40%. As we go through some of those, those crimes, uh, Dr. Wolf, I mean, for example, as far as reporting requirements to authorities, uh, we just heard now that there are now new standards in place. Are they effective? Will they protect us from the sort of, the sort of actions that we saw Glaxo performing? If they were enforced, they would be, they would be effective. But the Food and Drug Administration is largely funded directly in cash payments from the industry now. About of the budget for drug review comes in cash payments from the industry. So it is heavily tilted towards what is good for the industry. So I, I'm not very optimistic about that. Most of the examples you cited are examples of a drug that is approved for disease A and it is thought to be safe and effective for disease A, but they're not selling enough. It's still on patent and therefore, as Dean Baker said, they can charge much more. And as long as it's still on patent and as long as they can charge more, they will start pushing it for disease B and C and D for which there's no evidence that the benefits outweigh the risk. So this is a strategy widely used by companies to increase their sales way beyond what they would have if it was limited to the diseases for which the evidence favors the benefits as opposed to the risks. Well, once a, a drug is approved by the FDA, how do doctors become aware of the drug's existence? Is it simply as a result of the sales representatives who then fan out and tell them the good, good news, or, or is there some, in, you know, is, is there a constant sense of independent information about these drugs and what they should be used and what they shouldn't be used? Well, there is like some independent information, although a lot of the studies are funded by the industry. And if a doctor on her or his own decides to prescribe a drug for something for which it isn't approved, there's nothing the FDA can do. What is illegal and criminally illegal is for the company to use every tactic possible, ranging from drug sales representatives to hiring doctors to create a buzz saying, you're only using this for this, but we think, in our experience, it also works for this, or taking them, whining and dying them, or taking them to spas and so forth. So every technique that you can imagine. And fraudulent medical journal reports. I and mean, presumably yeah. then also there's a lot of... That's right. And a lot of these things are so subtle that it's only through conscientious whistleblowers in these companies that this comes to the attention. And these whistleblowers are criticized, well, they get a lot of money out of it. But shouldn't the medical journals themselves now not scot free, perhaps? And how, how are they allowing... Well, and these are, these are respected journals. Some certainly. of the better medical journals are very careful about these, but even those make mistakes. But sometimes these are printed or published in second-rate journals, but second-rate journals that many physicians will say, aha, that sounds great. I can now start prescribing one of these drugs for something else. So the culture, I mean, some would say the business model is to encourage them to commit crimes, to overstate the benefits in order to make more money than they're going to have to pay out when and if they get caught with the crime. So it's a business model of criminal activity and civil violation. Uh, you mentioned whistleblowers. Let's bring in Wendell Potter, actually, who's one of the more uh, famous whistleblowers of, of recent years. This must all sound very familiar. I mean, in fact, we, take a, we, we tend to explore the role of regulators quite a bit on this show, it seems, and, and there does seem to be a, a constant themes that we hear of revolving doors and, 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 and a, a, a bit too close a relationship between regulator and industry and so forth. Is that your sense of the, of the FDA as well? How effective is the FDA with oversight? No, it's exactly the, the case, a revolving door in the FDA and also for insurance companies uh, at the state level. Insurance commissioners are often uh, from the industry or go straight from the industry after that. Uh, there is that revol revolving door. And also, uh, keep in mind that these companies, uh, as I said earlier, uh, their first priority is to satisfy shareholders and, and uh, secondary is to, to satisfy the needs of their patients or, or, or patients in this country. Uh, and in this country, they're also allowed to advertise directly to consumers. So they spend an enormous amount of money marketing and the, the regulators are just simply not resourced adequately to do the policing that's necessary. And I will agree also, too, that until there are some uh, criminal prosecutions and convictions that this will this will continue. These these kinds of fines are just kind of the equivalent of, of parking tickets, or at best uh, for these companies. Before there have, just one, go ahead. There have been criminal fines and, and prosecutions, but no jail sentence. And as long right. as the fines are where they are, and the companies will make money literally off criminal activity, 
it's going to continue. The pharmaceutical industry has traditionally, for the last 30 or 40 years, had somewhere between 15 and 20 percent profit margins. They're now running out of new, exciting drugs, and some of these older drugs are soon to come off patent. So while they are still there under their clutches with no generic equivalent, they are squeezing legally or otherwise every bit of mileage that they can out of them. Just quickly before we move on, though, but just. As what you seem to be saying, though, is as far as oversight of these drugs are concerned, we don't really have any real way of knowing whether we're receiving all the clinical information about their efficacy and so forth. I mean, the, the oversight isn't terribly effective. Well, I mean, the Vandy was the one of the three drugs that, for a period of about four years, the company just didn't bother sending the FDA all the safety information, and therefore the FDA is a handicapped, so to speak, regulator doesn't have the full deck of cards to make the decision. We, we tried to get Avandia taken off the market, and part of the problem was some of the information that we now know about was missing then because the company chose to make it missing. I mean, that's a crime, but you would think that if someone or a company c commits a crime, results in deaths and injuries, they should go to jail? No, they just buy their way out by paying a trifling $3 billion. So, Dean Baker, and you've already perhaps given me the, you have given me the answer to this question, will the odd court case then keep pharmaceutical companies in line or is this to do with a system based on government granted patents? No, I, th I think the, the corruption is inherent in the system and I make an analogy, you know, think of illegal drugs, heroin, cocaine, where you have a markup of a thousand percent, ten thousand percent, there's enormous profit to be made here and you know we could tell these people we want them to be good people and everything but all the incentive the other way it's almost inconceivable to imagine we're going to crack down This is also supposed to be an incentive though for research and development of drugs basically. Well not necessarily, the incentive is finding something that you can market and in fact the these drug companies have hugely cut back their, their spending on research and development over the last decade. There's a big article in the Washington Post on Sunday that talked about all the unemployed uh, biochemists in the country because there have been huge cutbacks in research at most of the drug companies and in fact they've had very few blockbuster bl drugs over the last decade. How do research and development budgets compare with marketing budgets? Oh, they spend much more on marketing. Um, that's, you know, they, they've been... As and it's as getting as worse and worse over time. Yeah, you know, the point is once you have the drug, you know, as Sid was saying, you want to be able to sell it as widely as possible. That's marketing. You know, research and development, as they say, it's risky. That's exactly right. They don't want to do that. But is there a bit of a myth then, Dr. Wolf, of, of this in, innovation then in the, uh, being, uh, finding its basis in the private sector, or is it mainly from the government sector, the public sector? Well, a lot of some of the more promising drugs, AZT, the first treatment for AIDS, was actually developed by the National Institutes of Health, and they even did some clinical trials on patients. But then they gave it away for a small amount of royalty, actually, to the same company, GSK, back a long time ago. We actually sued them to try and invalidate the patent because they didn't have the names of the government people who did a lot of the work. So a lot of the fundamental basic research, and in some cases even clinical trials, are paid for by the government, but then the companies walk away with it. They get it on patent, and they sell it in whatever way they can. It's not true of every drug. But it happens so often that it's clearly a practice of business of these I suppose there's a sense, Dean Baker, though, that not only is there an incentive to conceal negative findings, but also to conceal positive findings that could be used by the wider scientific community as well, which is another problem of this, of this system. Yeah, well, one of the issues here is that you're going to promote drugs that you have a patent on. I remember in consecutive days, New York Times had an article about how aspirin is a very effective preventative against cancer. Well, no one was pushing that because there's no money to be made on it. The next day, there was a drug on him of it that turns out to be very effective in stopping chronic bleeding. The Army's been using it for years. It's not approved for that use more generally, but Army doctors have been saying it's very, very effective. You know, when people are blown up by a bomb or whatever, that's what you have to do, stop their bleeding. And, you know, obviously drug companies are interested in what they can get a patent on, what they could market. And, and the duplication, perhaps, of other hit drugs. Exactly. So, so if you could, you know, if Pfizer's got a big hit drug and you think you can get a chunk of that market, you're going to spend a lot of money on it. Maybe your drug's no better, maybe not even as good as theirs. But if you could market effectively, that's a lot of All money. All right, well, give us some specific alternatives to the current system of funding. Well, we only have about three minutes left. Well, we already <laughs> spend, the United States spends about $30 billion a year on biomedical research through the National Institutes of Health. There's no reason in principle you can't expand that. I won't say necessarily you want to all go through the National Institutes of Health. You can go through the private sector doesn't really matter, but the point would be that the funding would be up front. 
all the results would be in the public domain, both in the sense that we could all, you know, we'd go on the internet, find all those studies, they'd be right there for anyone, any researcher, or any doctor who wanted to see it. And then also the drug itself could be sold as a generic. We wouldn't be yelling about drugs that sell for hundreds of dollars or thousands of dollars. They all sell for five or ten bucks. It wouldn't be any big issue. Um, there was actually a bill proposed by Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders to do exactly this. It would set up a prize fund. It would be specifically for HIV drugs, which is a category where most of the cost of drugs is actually paid for by the government. So you could use the savings to pay for the research, and then we'd have these HIV drugs available for five, ten dollars a prescription. I think it would be a huge step forward. Uh, Wendell Potter, so, I mean, you have this kind of common sense approach then, which will take out some of the incentives to act as GlaxoSmithKline has in the past, it will increase scientific information, the free flow of information and research and development. From your understanding of both the healthcare system and the current administration perhaps and then the political system in the US, any chance of that happening? No. Uh, the pharmaceutical industry is one of the most uh, powerful and influential uh, lobbies in, 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 in the city, in, in Washington. Uh, they, in fact, during the healthcare reform debate, were able, at the very beginning, to make sure that they were not going to be too adversely affected by healthcare reform. That just gives you an idea just how effective they are in manipulating uh, what goes on in Washington. Uh, Dr. Wolf, I, mean, I know you're all very active in this field. I mean, how much of a discussion is there then, especially as we get case after case like this, of trying to improve the system once and for all? Though? Well, one of the hopeful signs is that the top litigating lawyer in the Food and Drug Administration itself has now said a couple of years ago and just a week or two ago in a talk that the only way that we can do something about this is to start putting people in jail. He's in a position to do it if he can get some cooperation from the Department of Justice and to have much larger fines. But, but still, Dean Baker, that keeps that fundamental system in, in place then. Though. Yeah, the research I, needs to change. I agree yeah, with I, I, I think we have to talk about a different system. I mean, I think it's great. I mean, people, you know, we're causing people's deaths. You know, there, there should be a serious sanction for that. You shouldn't just go home to your mansion and, you know, take your vacation. There should be a serious sanction for that. But I think at the end of the day, we have to talk about a different mechanism for financing research. Dean Baker, thank you very much. Wendell Potter, thank you as well. And